Genesis 1-1 opens with the phrase, In the beginning, God created. We must not race into the discussion of the create, creative activity of God without first of all thinking about his existence. This opening phrase provides us with a bold declaration of God's existence. It's not enough, however, for us to read this passage and affirm the existence of God. Many people in our society affirm the existence of God, but they cannot tell you what he's like. Because they do not know what God is like, many of these people find God to be irrelevant. They don't even know how their own lives are to be impacted by his existence. How many of you know someone who wholeheartedly believes in the existence of God, but has no ability to describe what he is like? For many people, God is a mysterious force that is somewhere beyond the realm of humanity. He is someone that we pray to, uh, and he is someone who can provide for us when we can't provide our own solutions. Such a belief is actually dangerous. James 2.19 warns us, You believe that God is one. You do well. But the, the demons, the, the spiritual beings who are actually opposed to God, also believe and shudder. So the demons believe in the existence of God, but this does nothing for them but bring condemnation. When a person affirms the existence of God, there must be an examination, a pursuit, a journey towards knowing more about him. In Isaiah 44, 6, the prophet urges us to seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he's near. And in Hebrews 11:6, we're offered the following words of hope. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. In a desire to seek God and know him, it is important that we turn our attention to the study of theology. My desire here is to introduce you to the broader subject of theology, and then think more specifically about what biblical theology has to say about God. If you're in a Christian ministry degree program here at Crown, you'll have uh, the opportunity uh, to take a systematics theology one or two, or you can take that as an elective course if you want to study these subjects in greater detail. Webster has defined theology as the study of religious faith, practice, and experience. Many scholars have found it helpful to develop a systematic approach to thinking about theology. Of course, there are other approaches, such as biblical theology and historical theology, but in systematic theology, most scholars have identified at least 10 key areas of religious belief. And so we study the Bible or bibliology. We can study God or theology proper, man, or what is sometimes called anthropology angels, or sometimes the more technical word, angelology, sin, or what is called martiology. Basically, that comes from uh, the Greek word for sin. Also, uh, Jesus Christ, or Christology. We study the Holy Spirit, or pneumatology. Again, pneuma coming from the Greek. Salvation, or soteriology. The church, ecclesiology. And the end times, eschatology. The study of theology is important for several reasons. First of all, correct belief helps us respond to God in love and worship. The Bible says, if you love me, obey my commands. And Jesus says, we should worship in spirit and truth. Secondly, theology helps us interpret our experience. We live in a day when experience sometimes tends to dictate belief. But God would have us to interpret our experience through a framework of correct belief. Recently, we've come to realize that there is a dynamic interplay between experience and belief and study of the word in terms of formulating our ideas about what we believe and how we should live our lives. But theology helps us interpret. Finally, there are many voices in society teaching different things. So grappling with theology will help you when you sort out truth and error. Today, we want to think briefly about 
theology proper. Theology proper is the study of God. It answers the question, who is God? We've already said that many people believe that God exists. Of course, not everyone believes. There are some atheists out there, but, but there are fewer of them than you would think. The problem is that many people don't know anything about what God is like. There's a good reason for this problem. Uh, A.W. Tozer describes this as the incomprehensibility of God. He opens his book on the study of God with this humble statement. God is not like anything. That is, he is not exactly like anything or anybody. So many people are right in struggling to know God because he's completely different. He's completely other. The beautiful thing about God, however, is that he wants us to know him, and he wants us to know what he's like. So he has chosen to reveal himself to us so that we can know him and know what he is like. So, how would you define God? In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, the response to this question is, God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. When we read in scripture, we see a, a variety of biblical descriptions of God. So, in John 4, 24, we read that God is spirit. In Hebrews 12, 21, we read that God is a consuming fire. In 1 John 1, 5, we read that God is light. In 1 John 4, 8, we read that God is love. If we were to try to find in the Bible somewhere a biblical definition of God, perhaps we would want to go to Exodus 3.14 where Moses has this encounter with God and, and God reveals himself to him and he says, I am who I am. It's almost as if that is the biblical definition of God. I am who I am. He is the self-existent one. This phrase here is actually a kind of play on the word to be. He is the one who is and was and will be. And this title also speaks of God's activity in relation uh, to the Israelite people. He is an active God who is present with them. This is uh, the word Yahweh, or actually uh, in uh, the Old Testament, they, they wouldn't even try to pronounce his name. It's the unspoken name of God. And so when they read this, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but when they encounter uh, this I am who I am title, this Yahweh word, usually the, the Jewish um, theologians and, and scribes will actually replace it with another word and say Adonai, because it's the holy personal name of As we read certain portions of scripture, we learn more about what is God, what God is like. When we learn something about the character of God, we learn about what theology calls one of God's attributes. An attribute is a, a permanent quality of God that constitutes who he is. They are the characteristics of his nature. Obviously, we don't have time to discuss all of the attributes of God today. That's probably not even possible for us to do anyway. So what I'd like to do in the following moments uh, is to review some of the important attributes uh, that uh, of God that are presented in the Genesis 1 and 2 accounts. First of all, in Genesis 2, we see this great affirmation of the, the oneness of God. In Genesis 2, the name most frequently used of God is Lord, L-O-R-D, all in capital letters. It's important that you realize the difference between the two words for Lord that appear in your Bible. Whenever, whenever Lord in all capitals appears, as it does in Genesis 2, the English Bible is translating the personal name 
that God revealed to Moses in Exodus 3. It's the representation of this idea of I am who I am. In Hebrew, this name is YHWH. There are actually no vowels there, so we don't know how to pronounce it, but most people say Yahweh. Whenever Lord appears in lower caps, it refers to God or men as someone who is a master, and that is the word Adonai. This is an important distinction. The use of Lord, or Yahweh, in all capitals, affirms the oneness of God because the Old Testament clearly teaches that the Lord is one God. So in, Gen in Deuteronomy 6.4 we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Secondly, we see that Genesis 1 affirms the triunity of God. In Genesis 1, the name most frequently used of God is Elohim. This Hebrew word is a plural word for God, and thus hints at the plural nature of God. In Genesis 1.26 we read, Then God said, here it's singular, Let us make, now we shift to plural, man in, again plural, our image. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Throughout the rest of scripture, the Bible teaches that the Godhead is made up of three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity is the way that we describe God being one and yet three. The Trinity then can be defined as three eternal and distinct persons of the Godhead in one divine essence. Again, this is a subject that would be explored further uh, in a systematic theology class, but this is the basic idea of the triunity of God, the idea of the Trinity. A third teaching that emerges in Genesis 1 is the idea that God existed before creation. Two important theological ideas emerge at this point. First of all, the idea of the pre-existence of God. This is the idea that God existed before creation. The second idea is the idea of the eternality of God. And this is the idea that God is without beginning and without end. And so in, in Revelation 1 and again in Revelation uh, 22 we read, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. A fourth teaching about God that emerges in Genesis 1 is the idea that God is all-powerful. And so we see here that God speaks and things come into existence. The idea that God created everything ex nihilo or, or out of nothing simply by speaking it into existence is a tremendous display of God's power. When we speak theologically of God being all-powerful, we generally use the word omnipotent. He is all-powerful. In concluding, I would suggest, suggest that you read all scripture with this question in mind. What does God want me to know about himself? Christian faith is not just about activity and experience. It's about knowing God and serving him with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And so Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. I trust that this course will help you in that great pursuit.